So we've, we've mentioned GI bleeding, we've mentioned hypovolemia, dehydration. Um, Elliot, before you alluded to infections can yeah. be a big problem in this population. How did those contribute to the symptoms of HE? Yeah, so uh, carrying on with what we're talking about, HE is, is often triggered by something. It's a biomarker that something else is happening. And one of the key ways that uh, you serve your patients well, if you really want to save a life, is that you search for that, uh, uh, in, that infection that could be in instigating this uh, episode. In particular, and, and you have done some excellent research on this topic, we are underutilizing diagnostic paracentesis to look for spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. We can't wait for someone to show up with a tender abdomen and fever. Often encephalopathy is the presenting symptom of that infection. And therefore, when a patient is showing up, particularly with HE and ascites, we have to look for that infection. We have to treat that infection in a timely fashion. And any infection, by the way, can precipitate HE. The liver-specific one is SBP. And Elliot's exactly right, it's missed. You know, the mortality of SBP for the last 30 years is unchanged. It's about 35%. So SBP is a serious problem, and the earlier you diagnose it, the better it is. And missing it, because people don't do diagnostic paracentesis when they have ascites and hepatic encephalopathy, is, is a no-no. But urinary tract infections, cellulitis, which our patients get frequently because they have edema, aspiration pneumonia, or pneumonia in general, all of these kinds of infections can precipitate hepatic encephalopathy, and it should be automatic when a patient presents with HE that you look for infection by doing blood cultures, a urine analysis, a chest x-ray, and a careful physical exam, and of course, a diagnostic paracentesis if ascites is present. I agree with those points, and I think even if there's any delay in obtaining a diagnostic paracentesis, that's really when we need to just administer antibiotics, just because of the mortality for these infections is so high. And we, you know, we, we often talk um, within my hospital, and I'm sure yours, about the importance of the diagnostic paracentesis, if at all possible. Um, just to, to put this to rest, um, because we get the question a lot, if a patient is thrombocytopenic or coagulopathic, is that diagnostic paracentesis safe? Do they need, you know, platelets and FFP beforehand? Yeah, so thank you for bringing that up. There is no reason to be afraid of performing a diagnostic paracentesis in a patient with cirrhosis who has an elevated INR or a decreased platelet count. Uh, I, I understand that their platelet count is lower or their INR is higher, but it simply does not mean the same as if someone was on Coumadin. They are not more likely to bleed from their paracentesis. There's a wealth of data behind that. And the overwhelming need to diagnose SBP in a timely fashion out, uh, outweighs all other risks. There's an artery that runs along the rectus muscle that you cannot hit. If you hit that artery when you do a paracentesis, whether the INR is normal or whether it's high, you don't have a good outcome. So you need to do a diagnostic paracentesis in the correct area. And if you do, as Elliot says, there absolutely are no contraindications based on thrombocytopenia and high INR. Now, I mean, if the INR is three or three and a half, or the platelets are 12,000 or 8,000, that's different. But with the typical thrombocytopenia that you see or INR elevations, even in the two to 2.5 range, Elliot, which is almost every case, Elliot's right on target do the paracentesis. It's very critical, and you, if you're doing it in the right place, you won't have any complications. Great. That's a very important lesson. Uh, just to round out these precipitants of HE, Dave, can you talk to us a little bit about when you go through that med list, are you looking for sedating type medications? Can that make HE worse? Yeah, thank you. That's an, that's an excellent question. There's, there's so many things that when I'm reviewing a patient's medication list that I'm looking for, for items such as benzodiazepines or narcotics for patients that have chronic pain. Um, other things like that uh, most clinicians aren't necessarily thinking about, things like proton pump inhibitors have also been associated with episodes of hepatic encephalopathy. So, um, and then again, like we had mentioned before, looking at the diuretic regimen, looking at lactulose and other things that we're using for hepatic encephalopathy. 
Great. And before we move on, just because it's such an important topic, precipitants, um, any others that we've forgotten? Any others that you look for when you're evaluating a patient with HE? Um, I think there's a, there's a couple of others, and one that flies under the radar is uh, sarcopenia. Well, it, it turns out that many of our patients, you, if you think about a patient with hepatic encephalopathy, they tend to look a certain way. Temporal wasting, they give you that antecedent history of muscle loss, their pants are falling off, their belt is extra tight. And the reason for that is that ammonia is directly toxic to the muscle, and on top of that, they're more likely to be malnourished, they're less likely to want to eat. But in the context of portal hypertension, muscle plays a critical role in handling ammonia. It comes at a price. Every molecule of ammonia that it eats up uh, causes uh, muscle degradation. But uh, the progressively sarcopenic patient is more likely to present with encephalopathy. There are a few others too, Arun, sure. I'm glad you mentioned it. Uh, some are common, some are not. Uh, common, constipation. Uh, constipation in the setting of severe liver disease can actually be related or uh, correlated with bouts of encephalopathy sometimes, probably from uh, bacteria that are in the colon and having more time for ammonia production and ammonia uh, to seep into the portal vein blood and eventually get to the brain. So constipation that's very severe can be contributory, certainly. And then less common ones, portal vein thrombosis and or the development of hepatocellular carcinoma. Those are potential causes by changing portal hypertension and worsening portal hypertension that can cause collateral formation and bypassing of the liver by uh, toxins such as ammonia and then eventually causing uh, hepatic encephalopathy by these toxins getting to the brain. Those are things, so a good imaging procedure is very important. Um, and uh, so, so those are a few less common. Oh, I should, tips, of course. We didn't talk about tips. Yeah. In the setting of tips, <laughs> hepatic encephalopathy is very common too. You don't always even need a precipitant in the setting of TIPS placement. So if patients have TIPS in, uh, in place, hepatic encephalopathy certainly shouldn't be a surprise. And because it's, it's such an important thing to know about, can you just describe for the audience what, what is a TIPS stent briefly and why might one be inserted in a patient like this? Yeah, so TIPS stands for transvenous intrahepatic portosystemic shunt. And the goal is to basically uh, put in a bypass circuit or a shunt that connects the portal vein, the incoming blood flow to the liver, to the hepatic vein, the outgoing blood flow of the liver. And the interventional radiologists do this at sophisticated centers. They go through the right internal jugular vein and go down to the liver in the vein uh, and put this uh, shunt, which is a straw about the size of my little finger, right through the liver. And the idea is it decompresses the liver. It alleviates portal hypertension because blood now coming in the portal vein doesn't run into a fibrotic liver that causes a decreased blood flow through the liver. It now goes through the straw or through the shunt. Uh, that helps a number of problems, particularly refractory ascites or very severe variceal bleeding, which is very important in an appropriate patient. It shouldn't, by the way, be done outside of those two indications for the most part. But the consequences are, if you do have toxins in the portal vein, ammonia being one, they now can go right through the shunt without any filtration by the liver, go out the back of the liver and later go to the brain and cause hepatic encephalopathy. Now these patients aren't typically encephalopathic all the time. They have episodes of encephalopathy typically, and precipitating factors can be uh, important here as well, but they may not. And encephalopathy is a very common problem after TIPS and can be a very vexing one to manage. Great, thank you.